thank you for coming this afternoon in the middle of the day uh, to uh, worm, how I'm going to say it. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. My name is Lisa Long. I am a curator at the Julia Stoschek Foundation in Berlin, where I, do, uh, where I lead the program. And I am in conversation today with Stanya Khan, who is in the In Focus section here at the film festival and who has had a couple of screenings so far and will also have another screening tonight. Um, and yeah, it was also part of the jury. Uh, so I, I'll be um, moderating this talk. Uh, it'll be about 45 minutes, I would say, um, to an hour. We have clips prepared as well, and uh, I will be introducing um, Stanya, and then there will be cues a Q&A at the end for any questions that you might have for us. Um, so, Stanya, welcome. Uh, Stanya Khan is an interdisciplinary artist who works primarily in film video with a practice that includes drawing, painting, sculpture, installation, sound, and writing. Humor, pathos, the uncanny, and the absurd are central to a hybrid media practice that seeks to rework relationships between fiction and document, the real and the hyperreal, narrative time and the synchronic time of impulse. In a long inv long-term investigation in the foreground, sorry, in a long-term investigation of how rhetoric gains and loses power, Khan's projects often situate language in the foreground of works that are dialectically driven by the demands and of the body. Sometimes language falls away altogether. Recent solo exhibitions include shows at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Wexner Center for the Arts, MoMA PS1, New Museum, British Film Institute, and Suzanne Fil Filmetter, Filmetter, Los Angeles Projects, and Corner House Manchester. Uh, her collaborative work with Harry Dodge has been shown at Elizabeth D. Gallery, the first exhibition I think you ever had in the art context, the Whitney Biennial Sundance Film Festival, MOCA Los Angeles, uh, again MoMA and Setka M in Karlsruhe, among others. Um, Stanya was a 2012 Guggenheim Fellow in film video, and her works are in the collection of the Hammer Museum, MoMA New York, LACMA, and the Walker Arts Center, just to name a few. So welcome. Thank you. So nice to be in conversation here publicly now after having, uh, after speaking over the last year, yeah. uh, well, off and on again. We're gonna start with uh, something that is maybe, at, or at the beginning, was at the very heart and foundation of your practice, writing. Uh, and language, and you actually studied writing uh, in art school, if I remember that correctly. I did. And um, you have said to me before that uh, writing was was the foundation for all your works, it later kind of gave away to this idea of editing, but I really wanted to start with writing, and I would love to hear more about how that writing practice, uh, especially in graduate school, shaped the the early works that you then or this early steps that you took into video and film. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you guys for being here. It's really nice to see you and glad you came out. Um, and thank you for coming all the way from Berlin to talk with me. Um, I'm excited. So yeah, um, I came from live performance and that performative work always started with text. Um, and then, so I would write and write and write, and then I would um, play around with like reading those texts, but moving around or with a costume on. And then as soon as the physical transformation happened, um, there was always a, I would have a visceral response to putting on some kind of costume and it would sort of transform my state of mind, and so then that would change how I would deliver the text, and so then I would go back and rewrite, because then the text would change. So sort of coming off the page, through the body, the text would become a different thing, and then I noticed that inevitably I would improvise, especially in performance, and sort of live editing, whatever that script had been based on what the energy is in the room or how people were responding or like, oh shit, they didn't laugh at that one. Okay, ha <laughs> ha, and then I'm like, okay, I've got to find a way to connect and then make a new bit of text. And so then there would be another rewriting process 
based on that experience. So the writing always sort of was like this living thing, which they did not like in graduate school. <laughs> um, they were like, we don't know what to do with you. We don't do performance here. And I was like, oh, well, that's OK. It's still just writing. It's still just text. And um, so in graduate school, really, there was this um, demand that I just write for the page, because that's all they wanted to deal with. So I learned a lot doing that. Um, but it's not really um, my practice, in a way, with writing. So I. <clears throat> I wrote a collection of short stories for my MFA th thesis and didn't pursue that path. Like, I came out of grad school making videos. <laughs> um, Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that, so the transition from performance to video made a lot of sense and continued um, evolving this kind of scripting. Um, hybrid with improvising and um, that um, that helped me uh, again feel I, I think what I brought with me into video making was that kind of body memory of what it's like to perform for a live audience and to feel the energy in the room and to realize that part of textual production is this relationship between you and the audience. It's not like this one-way channel. And um, so I think that really influenced the way that I edit. And we can talk more about that as we go. But um, if we want, we can show a clip from It's Cool, I'm Good, yes. um, which was from 2010. So now that's pretty old. Um, I'm old. <laughs> um, uh, that piece, I would write jokes and write ideas and write material and um, kind of keep this notebook right near me. You'll see the character a lot of times is, is sort of bedridden. And this would be this notebook sort of near me. And um, life is hard. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, so we see this character uh, who has clearly had some terrible accident. Um, but still perseveres and goes on a a wandering kind of situation, as many of your characters do. Not only ones that you play, but the mm -hmm. the actors or, or people that you work with yeah. are often shown in these kind of wandering situations. Uh, so, who is this character speaking to when she speaks to the camera? And like, where is? And then maybe yeah. to tie that into what we were mm -hmm. talking about before of scripted kind of written language and improvisation and performance, uh, how much is, like, what's the, the relationship or the ratio kind of between, between yeah. the, in these situations? Yeah, thanks. Those are good questions. Um, so um, the idea is that, um, the, that she or they, whatever they are, um, kind of sort of hijacked these nurses in a way, right, that there are these home care people who are coming to help out. And um, in my mind, I was thinking um, that I, I wanted us to linger in this kind of suspended place between not knowing whether this person was dying or going to recover, um, and that maybe the presence of a camera signaled the idea of an impending end, so therefore like a record of something. And so um, in some of the other shots, you see um, a person in scrubs, and there are various different kind of like home nurses that come, and they each are the ones holding the camera. So they're always addressing the nurses. Um, every now and then, there will be someone. So in fact, in this scene at Wiener Schnitzel, um, this was just shot, you know, in pub public, you know, in the middle of the night. And um, some guy wandered up and he was like, oh, man, what happened to you? <laughs> and so I just made up a story on the spot. And I talked about getting attacked by a shark and that I had been like on a jet ski. And then I got hit by a jet ski. 
and just made up this story. And he was like, what? Oh my God, you shouldn't even be alive. And I was like, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> so that obviously was completely improvised, but this character was already, and this was a, this is the trippy thing for me anyway, um, about costume is that um, it really affects you know, it kind of becomes a state of being. And so I even think about, like, instead of thinking about character so much, I think about states of being and that maybe this is just representational of a certain state of being that I was imagining um, being close to death and what kind of language emerges from that state and what kind of, oftentimes it's got gallows humor, right? Because there's little left to lose. And so that came a lot. So a lot of the um, improvising happened in part because of being in this bandaged state. And so things would flow out that I didn't expect. And also a kind of obnoxiousness, like sometimes this character would just really be flirting with the nurses and be like, you're hot. You know, the other nurse was really hot, but you're, you're smart too. And like, just... <laughs> I was like, who is this? Who is this person coming through? And so, um, again, kind of letting a state of being create language. Um, and then there's always this shoot, like writing, improvising and shooting, and then going back and rewriting or writing more. So as I get to know the character or the state of being, then I can generate more texts and then we can shoot again kind of thing. So that is sort of a recurring process. I don't know if I answered that. So the body, I guess, uh, I read also in this um, beautiful interview that you gave with Grant Walquist oh, yeah. about this, this idea of the state of being and this kind of metaphorical, um, like a body that is not necessarily portraying a character, yeah. but is because staying a little bit more abstract and is becoming a vessel for these ideas that are actually more like political commentary on societal issues or psychological, emotional states, inner feelings, and kind of how we personally deal with these in, in relationship to you know society at large. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was really on point and very um, interesting from a from like a from a language perspective of how yeah. to uh, how to show something or describe something. Uh, without maybe saying it 100%, which humor often does, which is so yeah. ingrained also into your work. Yeah. Um, I guess you're just a very funny person, it would seem, from every uh, almost every work that I've seen. There are always m mm. moments of relief, mm. I would say, because actually that's what the humor often is doing in your work, is creating this type of uh, relief in regards to these very horrible situations or also horrible body situations that we are seeing yeah. um, that are very visceral and kind of... Um, yeah, make us cringe a little bit uh, at uh -huh. imagining what would happen. Yeah. Um, and so, I think what I lo like what I like about this, and I this is something that we don't have here in this clip, but uh, of a show of a, an earlier video that was it's also in the program called Winner, where you had this alter ego Lois, mm -hmm. um, I guess who was a little bit more of a character and who was developed at, during grad yeah. school more yeah. and. I was so I was just wanted to touch one like sure. last time a little bit yeah. on this idea of the alter ego or again on this kind of character yeah. um, and how um, yeah what kind of what it enables you to do right like yeah. what 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 did Lois or yeah. perhaps this other yeah. character like what does that how did it free you from from certain constraints maybe that yeah you know? the thing yeah the constraint of the self right like um being being a self uh, i'm uncomfortable <laughs> being a self i guess whatever that means um i said to someone the other day i can't we were talking about like aging and our bodies and whatever and i was like i just wish i could be smithereens i wish i could just be released from having a body at all in a way um sort of tired of dealing with it um <laughs> but uh so um Lois um, and this character, I guess they allow me to um, maybe go, like, uh, it frees 
me up from a, a sense of self so that um, ideas can come forward or again, like states of being. Lois is this character who, if you, um, we'll be showing this short later at like 4.15 over at the Kino, but I think it's also online and you can watch it. Um, um, she's kind of this loner, she's um, an artist. Um, I think that what that character allowed me to sort of tap into is the, again, like this, what's the existential state of, um, feeling alone, but you've got all this stuff you want to share with the world, but you're sort of terrified of people, um, which is not that far from how. <laughs> They're all pretty close to the vest, you know what I mean? And so um, I put on this kind of dorky windbreaker and um, comb my hair over to the side and become this character, Lois, who is really comfortable hijacking camera space and um, convincing people to listen to her stories and kind of go on weird journeys with her. So um, that's that's kind of how that operated. And um, also, uh, it's like a faucet comes on when I would put on her windbreaker. Um, uh, she has a lot of access to language, and it would just flow. Um, but I think it's really about making um, a space where um, I'm comfortable for certain material to come forward. And again, my interest really is never about like me or my personal feelings so much as I'm hoping that whatever's coming through the character, the being, is something that other people can connect to and go, oh yeah, I kind of feel like that. Or, oh, she seems familiar. Or, oh, that poor. Sometimes people like with the can't swallow it, can't spit it out. Um, sorry to reference things you haven't seen, but um, uh, another character, um, sometimes go, people will go, oh, that's, that person is crazy, right? That person is insane. And oftentimes my thought was, oh, I don't see them as insane. Um, or I see that as a state of being that we all have, which is maybe a stream of consciousness rattling through our worries and distresses. Um, so. And also with a very philosophical strength to it, I have to say, <laughs> uh, can't swallow it, can't spit it out. Highly recommended. Um, so you have these earlier works where you're playing the characters yourself. And then in 2014, you made a feature length film called Don't Go Back to Sleep, where I guess for the first time in such a larger scale, you asked other people to use the same type of method as you were using on yourself in this way of like improvising and script writing. So <laughs> we're clearly in some post-apocalyptic <laughs> moment again. Uh, yeah. Have the zombies come? Um, no, <laughs> the police happy. have come, and they've come, and they've come, and they've come. And so the idea was sort of that all, and again, it's always sort of a bit allegorical, right? Not quite literal. But I thought, what if the only people left are frontline emergency workers, right? Helpers, whose job is to sort of help people live, and um, the state. And so um, they are kind of, um, and the other idea was that they wouldn't know each other, that they would be strangers to each other having to work together under pressure. Um, so um, collectivity on the spot. And um, so they are kind of in these, they're basically squatting these empty houses um, and setting up triage centers. But of course, mainly the people who come our other wounded emergency workers, and um, one of them dies, the one in the bathtub. And so it's sort of a, not a lot happens. It's really about these workers and the time they spend with each other waiting, in a way, to fi again, in the space between are we going to survive or are we not? And I guess that's a recurring um, question, in part, because that's the state we live in, right? Um, it's so precarious, endlessly. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, it's just funny, like, that I had made It's Cool, I'm Good with, you know, all the nurses sort of being witness, and then I gave them their own film. <laughs> um, but yes, so here, again, I had done a bunch of writing and then thought, oh, it's really awkward to have, that it will be bad acting if I ask them to do my script, or that's how I, what's what I worried. And I also was interested in, could I make a narrative feature built from 
or built with the agency of the participants. So I thought if they also were creating texts, that then the process of making the film would also reflect the ideas in the film about collectivity and power and agency and labor and surviving. So I would put them into situations and um, uh, sometimes just give them a basic direction like, um, okay, fill these Tupperware containers with milk. Um, and that would be this recurring activity in the film of people filling bottles with milk. Because at the time, milk, this was during um, uh, Tahrir Square and numerous uprisings around the world where people were being tear gassed a lot and people were using milk to soothe their eyes from tear gas. And so a lot of the characters in the film are filling containers with milk. But that was the only direction I gave those two. And he was like, I have this phobia of spilled milk. And then she was like, yeah, my mom put me in the bathtub and poured it all over me. And so I didn't, they wrote that. They, they did that and it was like amazing. I couldn't have written that. So there was things like that throughout or um, there are other scenes in which I, or, or with the, the bathtub scene, um, I said the direction was just, you know, she's dying and there's probably nothing you can do to save her. Um, just go in and talk to her. And if the person said, well, I'm, I don't know what to talk to her about, I think one of the prompts, I said, well, you could tell her all the different jobs you've done. And so she started listing all these amazing jobs that she's done. So, um, yeah. That, and it's nerve wracking to work that way, to work so improvisationally. Um, but I am committed to it. <laughs> Yeah, and it also, uh, as I said in like the introduction, you have this, it's like a kind of like reality reality TV um, or a, a, a speculative documentary in a way. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about that it goes a little bit or goes away from language but has also goes through all of these um, works that we've talked about so far and some that we've seen and also goes into Stand in the Stream, which is something that we'll be getting to next, is this idea of witnessing. And I think it's very much uh, a very, very prominent question in your work because of how you use the camera and the way that you interact with the camera. Um, and especially uh, by giving the, uh, you know, the unknown person behind the camera this type of agency in, in the way that you're in, di you know, in dialogue with them all the time. Uh, but also in Can't Swallow It, Can't Spit It Out, uh, the camera person is a type of paparazzi in a way. Um, at least that's how I would um, think of it. And so I wanted to talk about witnessing because we are seeing something that is true. It's a self, but it's not fully true, it's, there's fiction, you know, it's fiction as well. Um, and it, it touches on uh, the difference between witnessing as, uh, as a document, as also something like a, uh, something that we have to do as humans, especially uh, in the situations around the world where uh, there is abuse of power, um, but also the abuse of power that lies within uh, the, the, spec the spectacle of witnessing as well, so looking at you know, someone who has an accident. Um, and kind of interesting that you said that this man that came up and asked you what had happened and you gave him a story, like you fed into that uh, kind of uh, curiosity or concern at this point we wouldn't know, but that he had. Um, so I wanted to ask you how you deal with this like slippery line between witnessing documentation, recording and spectacle. Uh, and pain also that we see, bodily pain, but also kind of the pain that we access, uh, experience within society. Um, thank you, that was a lot of good ideas. What was the question though? <laughs> Just sorry, <laughs> this, sorry though, so like the, how you deal with uh, both through technique, but also maybe personal uh, politics approach oh, to the difference okay. between what oh. is, what is, what does it mean to witness? Yeah. Uh, and when do we need to when do we need to uh -huh. witness and what and how do we stay away from spectacle and how uh -huh. like but why is spectacle uh -huh. so interesting or kind of so right. exciting as well right um, and how the works that we've seen so far um, but also winner 
um, can't swallow it, can't spit it out, uh, and yeah. Um, yeah. I think. Deal with uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, and I, I, I think that my relationship to the idea of witnessing changes it um, has changed over the course of time. So, for example, when we were making this piece, can't swallow it, can't spit it out, which I'm sorry again, we're not showing here. Um, uh, what was on our minds at that point, what, the way that we motivated the camera was that um, this camera person was wandering around on the streets um, waiting to capture an abuse of power. So um, we were thinking about uh, the beating of Rodney King and we were thinking about how that moment of citizen witness with a video camera really changed kind of the world in a way and changed um, kind of consumer relationship to video recording. And um, so we were thinking about that and thinking, okay, so um, now it's a more common thing to do with a camera, so maybe this person is out there. And then what they encounter is this person who, um, she's got a bloody nose and she's wearing like a Viking helmet and carrying a big foam piece of cheese. Um, so she, in a sense, is a spectacle, right? But the spectacle, the spectacle brings themselves to the camera. So she goes up to the camera and she's like, what are you doing in the bushes, man? You spying? You spying? You know? And, and he's like, no, I'm, you know, and, and um, so again, she kind of hijacks the camera space, but so it's like the spectacle goes, um, it, she goes, oh, so you're looking for action, huh? You're, you're waiting to catch the action. And of course, she just kind of follows him around and keeps trying to get in, in to the view of the camera and she inadvertently becomes the action, but she's telling stories and she's talking about everything from like how to stab a person or not to shoot someone over property. Um, she she tell so kind of s traumatic stories unravel, um, but again, so spectacle is in the story, not in the visual action. So we're not watching anything terrible happen, but we're hearing someone recount, so I guess that's one way that I've thought about um, uh, skirting, definitely skirting violent spectacle and also not wanting to like, I don't have an interest in like re-traumatizing a viewership. Um, and so that's something I'm always thinking about as well, is how, because um, a lot of the work is about trauma and I tend to use humor a lot as a way to, in so many ways, trauma, humor and trauma are, are very related in that there, there's a thing um, we're not supposed to say, right? And so when humor is working, hopefully, it's saying a thing you're not supposed to say or it's pulling up the corner of the rug and showing the dirt underneath, right? Um, and that's sort of the job of humor. Um, so, those were all performative though, you know, and like c constructed witness, but like based on this idea of witness and wanting to invoke that, right? Wanting to have it be present in the work, this idea that um, we're accountable to each other to, to witness spectacle um, or to witness abuse of power, sorry, and not turn it into spectacle. And how do we not is the question in a way, um, which is another problem for the internet um, for us to think about. but. Uh, what I was going to say was then with Stand in the Stream, which we'll show you a clip of soon and also is playing in its entirety later this evening, um, um, it became really different. And that was, I slid more into sort of like a documenting space. Um, and I started sort of documenting um, tons of things in my personal life, things I saw in public. Um, um, my mother's, I had made a film about my mother um, years ago and that was the first sort of like witnessing and that actually film started because she said to me, um, I wanna tell you how I wanna be buried and I want you to videotape it so you don't fuck it up. <laughs> And I was like, okay, mom. So I got the video camera out and she started telling me about her burial plan. Um, and then I just kept shooting her. And 
suddenly the camera was this good mediating device for our relationship. And so over the course of two years, I filmed her talking. And so um, when she got sick with dementia, I kept filming through the course of her decline and her death. And um, so you see that in Stand in the Stream, but you also, I was um, through, so I made this film of the course of six years. So over that time, I was filming, filming, filming on all kinds of, it's very lo-fi, because um, uh, I was shooting on whatever shitty camera I had. And I started in 2011, so it was like crappy cell phones, um, little elf, cameras, um, whatever I had on me at the time, um, was filming a lot of things I was encountering and then kind of cataloging those into categories like live animals, dead animals, people on buses, um, people in the streets. And then um, the other thing I was doing was, and I guess this is another form of witnessing, right? Is so I started making that film with the question, um, is the internet, and again, you have to remember this was 2011, right? So still sort of figuring out how to interface with the internet, and I was wondering, is it really a place where community can be developed and connection can happen, or because it's all owned by giant corporations, are we just marketing fodder and that's impossible for real connection to happen there? Um, so I was spending a lot of time in chat rooms and chat roulette, which doesn't even exist anymore, and going online and also watching a lot of live streams. And so I started, screen recording all of these live internet um, experiences. So in the film, anything you see that looks like found footage or is online it was, was a live, it was only from a live stream. And that was this way in which I felt like it was important for that I was being a witness to a thing going on, whether it was an uprising somewhere across the world and activists were live streaming and uploading or whether it was in a chat room that I, that kind of skin in the game thing was like, I was there if I couldn't be at the place. I was still filming and being present in some way. And then of course that question fell away a little bit because I was like, right, the internet is both of those things. It's this corrupt space where we're marketing fodder and also, yes, community clearly happens there and connecting does happen and it's just this tool that we use that's problematic. Um, so I guess that, is kind of those are some of my thoughts on on witness. Um, what I yeah, what I really like, what I really like about the uh, about stand in the stream is this these two different scales: the very personal scale that you have the relationship with your mother, also the birth of your son uh, is is in the film, and then this very global scale: these protests that are going on around uh, the world, especially in the United States as well. Yeah. Um, as you said, it was shot over six years, so there's Trump's election happened during that time and all of these other things uh, that were really kind of changed the US and the political landscape in the US quite a bit. It's one of the most dense videos I've seen. Uh, it, it, there are times where it's very overwhelming, where the kind of the speed also in which different images, very disparate images get put together uh, is uh, a little bit claustrophobic. And uh, then you have these moments with your mother that are very intimate and uh, a little bit slower. And I wanted to ask you how, over, over the course of six years, how did you deal with all these images? And how did you decide, or how did you weave them together? Because that kind of blows my mind. Um, yeah, it was a, a, a tricky process and part of why it took so long was because it kept confounding me. Um, so I would shoot and edit, so I'd put things on a timeline and um, I'd make some music so that there would be sound and um, at a certain point I had an edit that I, um, you know, it was, it was going somewhere and I just kept feeling like um, it's too many screens, it's alienating, it's blocking, it's gonna block people out. And this was before any footage of my mother was integrated into it. It, it was just all of this footage, but without her. So, um, and um, one, one rule of editing that I kind of have used over the years is to um, start with what you like. So, 
oftentimes I would just only pick the footage I was the most excited about, and that was a good place to start. And I knew that there were going to be um, animals, there was gonna be people in public spaces. I, I, I had these categories, right? It was almost like a library I had amassed in these hard drives, but it wasn't like I shot for six years and then sat down to edit. I was editing constantly over the course of that time, and I, you see actually in there, in one of the chat roulette scenes, we're on the set of Don't Go Back to Sleep, and the nurses, are, and because we'd be shooting, and I go, oh my God, hold on, you guys. It's now, you know, 4 p.m. in Brazil, and there's a massive bus strike uprising. I've got a sign online. So we would, so um, anyway, I got to this point where I realized that something about the footage was alienating. Um, um, the screen, 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 and I thought there needs to be a person. We need a human. I miss people, and <laughs> um, I. So what I did was I went into my basement actually, and I put on Lois's windbreaker, and I started filming myself in my basement and filming her. I was like, I was like, well, let's just pretend it's the end of the world, and she's down there, and there's only like this much water in her jug, and that's it. And when the camera battery runs out will know she's died, um, or that she's going to die. And she'll improvise from that place. And so I shot some of that footage, and I edited her in. And it worked like a scaffolding, and I was able to see, OK, yes, it does need a person, but not a performed person. So I then had had enough distance from my mom's death to be able to start looking at that footage. Um, and I was concerned that. Um, the intensity of the footage of my mom, because it also includes her actual death and dying, um, I didn't want it to be a cheap shot. I didn't want it to be easy, like, oh yeah, well this will be intense. So that uh, was a concern. So I tentatively, kind of cautiously, started editing it in and started including some of the older footage where she talks about being a laborer, she was a shipyard worker in um, San Francisco shipyards and um, for 18 years, and she was an activist. And so I started incorporating some of that in and realized that there could be this structure that wouldn't have to be about her per se or me per se or about my family, because again, my interest isn't autobiography. Um, my interest is in could there be a story that maybe is about um, an older generation of activists giving way to a new one, things like that. Um, so that helped me integrate the footage in a way that felt like, OK, this is not just for intensity's sake. Um, and um, I don't know how to explain how the choosing, it's um, there's so much footage, and you just kind of, yeah, you go. It's like writing, just to circle back. But editing is so much like writing. It's the same in a way. You are making choices, you're going back over it again. So I do draft after draft. There's probably like 60 drafts of this film, you know? So you just would, you can just go back and move things around and change it until you feel, and always having, always putting in sound, because sound changes everything. And then, um, yeah, and then Trump got elected, and I, you know, my son was 12, I guess, at the time, and he was out in the streets with us protesting, and it just felt like, okay, this is where we end. We end with this terrible new beginning. <laughs> but also with the energy of a uh, next generation, yeah. I would say, and I really like the end of um, Stand in the Stream. You have a, de it's dedicated to, to the youth, yeah. uh, which I think is, um, well, very touching, actually. Uh, and it is something that you then thought about, I guess, more in No Go Backs, which is the last yeah. film that we'll be talking about today. Yeah. Um, and is something that, where you follow a, a, a group of four adolescent um, people who are kind of searching Playf playfully searching for something after, I guess, again, in another apocalyptic kind of situation where we don't know what is exactly going on if humanity still exists, but they are still ex they still exist. Um, but they're very innocent about it in a way, which I, uh, watching it again, was 
kind of um, the the imminent danger that is that you can also feel, even though it's very beautiful and also sometimes meditative film, um, is not always doesn't seem like they always realize that when they're kind of playing and trying on these traces and things that they're finding. Can you tell us, it's very different yeah. from the kind of image frenzy that we had yeah. from Stand in the Stream, yeah. uh, different pace, and uh, maybe more hopeful also in a way. <laughs> um, tell yeah. us what motivated you to kind of make this work also with uh, your son playing yeah. in it as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is, it, it's funny, after, after, I, when as I was finishing this film, it occurred to me that it's almost like a sequel to Stand in the Stream. Um, uh, in in the way that it like it's completely different shape. So like Stand in the Stream is all these multiple digital formats, and this was shot on super sixteen millimeter film, which even just the process of filming is a much slower process. You have to set everything up. We were shooting without a monitor, so we weren't seeing like the kids never saw the images until they saw the, the edit, um, which was kind of cool. We were sort of shooting blind. Um, and so it's much slower. And um, I think, you know, the way, the kind, I guess the kind of maker I am is that I make based on um, whatever is going on at the time. I don't feel um, beholden to a style or um, a genre or format, so, um, which is a nice, um, it's hard, uh, <laughs> markets don't like that, but um, it gives me permission as an artist to do whatever I want to do and to respond to how I'm feeling. So in the moment, I was feeling, um, so I started shooting this in 2000, the end of 2018, 2019, uh, beginning of 2019, and I was, um, you know, we were a few years into Trump. I was um, just feeling low, and um, they kept, in the news at that time, kept showing the doomsday clock thing, and I kept thinking about what is it like for these young people to be having this clock held over their heads about <laughs> the impending end. Um, and so it just sort of came to me sort of all at once that we would, again, similar to, I guess, to all the work, but like the way I talked about Don't Go Back to Sleep being allegorical and not exactly literal. So as this, I thought, we don't need to name, you know, um, narratively name what it is the kids are escaping from in the city. We know they are escaping collapse, whether that is police brutality, climate collapse, unaffordable everything, you know, the impossibilities, the rise of fascism, like these things that are collapsed that we're living in all the time now. Um, and so I thought, we just need to see them leaving the city and we will know they are leaving and they're having to go figure something else out. So that was the idea, is that we've got to figure something else out. And um, so that's what I was thinking about. And so I knew the trajectory that they would take and again, this is not explicitly said in the film. In the same way that like in Don't Come Back to Sleep, all of the houses we shot in, um, I shot only in houses that had been left empty um, by the housing crash. So they were things that had been started to be developed and built, and then the investors went broke in the 2008 housing crash. So that was like, you don't know that in the film, but that was my own like weird psychic criteria. And so here, you don't really know it in the film unless you know this area of the Eastern Sierra, but we're following the waterway, the, Cal the Los Angeles aqueduct. So it's, we're following the route of Los Angeles's water and where it gets its water, which is a very fraught issue because um, there's not enough water um, so that's the path they're on. Um, and I don't remember the other part of your question, but um, yeah, it's it's a different, slow, quiet. Um, and one of the things, I guess, about it too that's really different is that um, I shot with a really long lens so that I could keep a distance from the kids, which is also different than Stand in the Stream, which is very kind of in the face and very close up and present. Um, because I, 
I wanted to somehow foreground, again, I don't know if it comes across in the work or not, but I was thinking about their autonomy and how I didn't want to make a teenage movie where with like adult projection of what teenage space is and um, to let that be autonomous and be a little unknown to me and um, also sort of maybe let that operate on, um, on a broader level around not co-opting otherness, not co-opting space we, that's not ours, just sort of thinking, what if I could structurally do that with the camera, you know, as a way to represent that idea of um, giving autonomy and giving autonomous space. I don't know. So yeah. Should we open that's it up? That's a great uh, <laughs> final word, okay. um, to give autonomy and open up space. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So will. someone will have to someone will hand you a mic. microphone over there. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, I, I see that you have like a very American voice in your sense of humor. Uh, in the way that you make fun of your own misery and pain. I want to know what allows the American culture to make fun of that. Because if you look at American, at the great American comedies, that's what they're about. So uh, yeah, I don't know if you have an answer for that. Hmm. I almost want to say, well, what do you think? But um, I... That's a really interesting question and a big question. So I think that I'll just try to speak um, from myself, um, that I use humor probably in part to deflect um, pain. So it's a coping device. Um, and um, there's also in, well, you know, all over the world, but I guess in America as well, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little bit in a tradition of um, political satire, or I hope that I am in any case, where um, uh, there's a mode of humor that is um, uh, making fun of power, and that's one way to speak to power, um, is through satire and humor. And so um, for me also, I've, I personally have found that um, humor's been a way for me to connect with people. And so when I can, when we can laugh together, it makes a little bit more space for me to introduce that which is tragic or difficult. Um, um, and have it be less, maybe a little less um, scary or alienating because I want us to be able to go to the difficult places together. Um, and humor has been a way that lets me do that, to introduce, to let um, difficult material be present. Um, yeah. Thank you. OK, I hope that helps. I don't know. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for this and thank you for your work. And it's really, it's really nice to be here and hear you speak about it. Um, I think, yeah, I have many questions, but one of them would be a little bit about your process of editing. Um, yeah, in a way, I, I'm just curious how you work with, uh, you shared a little bit uh, with the feature length, with the, what's the title? Uh, Standing in the Stream. Um, that you've been collecting a lot, and then um, kind of using intuition and choosing what f what you like best, and based on that, working on the film. But I wonder if that's a way you work with other films, or similarly to what you just described with camera work, choosing a method and a tool that fits the, the work like what you said about the autonomy and long lens versus, yeah, the co-workers film and more intimate way of filming, whether that kind of every single time choosing a different approach, different method of 
in regards to editing, whether that's also the case or your work. Yeah, just like if you could share a little bit how you approach editing. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it is a little diff. It's it. Um, the approach is different for each project. Um, I guess similarities and through lines are that um, I always start editing a little bit while I'm in production. So that's, that's something I always do because I don't tend to write screenplays. And so what I have to do, even if I have the story in my head or I've, I, I sometimes I storyboard or I, I have a lot of notes and we shoot based on those notes, but um, it always helps me to start putting raw footage on the timeline right away. Even, you know, as soon as I get footage, I start throwing some of it onto a timeline and that helps me know what might be missing or it, it helps me write the story. So there's a real back and forth between how, like the story's being written in part through editing and shooting and editing and shooting and note taking and writing. And it's, so it's like kind of these three things that I'm using. And then when I really sit, oh, and then sound. Um, and so then when I really sit down to kind of do the cuts, um, I'm looking at my notes, whether that has to do with like um, the arc of a story where I think it's going and how to build that. Um, and then there's a lot of changing around of order. Um, it's different for each project, but I would say also just that sound plays a huge part, and especially in the, in the pieces that don't have much dialogue, like No Go Box has no dialogue at all. And so the sound is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for um, dynamic range, and so um, and a lot of it has to do with timing, just feeling, feeling timing. Um, and some of that, again, I think maybe just comes from having been a performer, my sense of timing. Um, I'm always thinking about you guys. I'm always thinking about um, the viewer and how are they flowing with this and how will they flow with this. Um, and I, I, I know that some artists say, well, they don't, they, you don't want to think about your audience. And um, for me, I'm, I do think about the audience, not in a way that makes me self-conscious or that I'm trying to please somebody, but in a way that I'm thinking, well, this is for the people. This is for people to view. And I'm thinking about how it will affect you and how can I try to shape it in a way that I think will work um, to connect again. So I hope that answers <laughs> your question. Um, anybody else? Yep. Some. Let's see. There's someone in the back and someone in the front. Hi, Estonia. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so you spoke a little bit about your relationship uh, with humor and how that manifests in your films, but I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uncanny or the gory, which I think is most prominent in your short film, Happy Song For You. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just maybe talk about uh, the uncanny and the gory and its relationship to the tragic. Thank you, yeah. Um, is that Inaya? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks, that's a great question. Yeah, um, I think um, it's funny. I, I've been um, dealing less and less with the overtly yucky <laughs> as time has gone on, maybe and maybe perhaps because it, um, things have become so overtly awful and gory um, just in, in life. Um, I mean, I guess they always have been, but I, I think there's been a pronounced shift since, um, you know, this kind of more current rise in fascism, I guess, is really, um, has changed the kinds of images that I produce. But in, in making the earlier work, um, uh, I think, again, th it felt like um, that kind of um, uncanny um, abject space um, uh, was a way to externalize that what's inside. Um, and so, 
again, it's always a little bit metaphorical, right? But going, well, this is what if, what if, you know, it's kind of like punk rock, right? Like, what if, what if we said outside what it feels like inside and give it an image? Well, the image is going to be kind of yucky. Um, <laughs> so that's where a lot of that came from. And actually, the piece that you're talking about, Happy Song for You, I made um, in collaboration with the painter Lynn Fawkes. Um, and I don't know if you guys know his work, but he was working mostly in the 50s and 60s. Um, and 70s in Los Angeles and one of the things he's known for is he may, would make these paintings of these like businessmen with their scalps peeled back and like these weird bloody heads but it was also red paint so it was very much about painting um, and so uh, we worked together on that and one of the things we shared in common was this um, being really comfortable with um, kind of spooky spaces um, and so a lot of the stuff in that film um, was based on his work. Um, but I think being in proximity to death is something that um, I guess is always palpable in my thinking. Um, and you know, like uh, Julia Kristeva talks about the uncanny and she talks about um, that it's like sitting next to a corpse and that you almost never are gonna be sitting next to a corpse. Um, and um, that, that sentiment sticks with me a lot that was in her book, um, Black Sun on Depression. And um, I think about that a lot, um, like if you're sitting next to a corpse, what that's like. So the materiality of death, but also just being in proximity to our own death, to death all around us, and what are ways to, um, to explore that. Sorry, that was a really long answer. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, I actually have a question, which is continue about what you said about um, miscommunication. For example, some people, when they see an image, they think it's violent, yeah. but maybe for another person, they understand in another way. And I feel like, um, as I'm also a film student, sometimes I make image, and people understand in totally different way. And in this situation, how do you think about the responsibility you have and as an artist, and how can you challenging people and really like trying to express yourself while also caring about people's feelings because different people have different kind of trauma and it's really hard to predict. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question and it's an ongoing question too as an artist. I don't know that I've figured it out, you know what I mean? But um, it's one I think about a lot. And so, well, one thing I think about, and I think I mentioned this early, is this idea of re-traumatizing a viewer and that that's never my interest. Um, and so, but at the same time, so let's see. Um, you know, there's not, it's such a great question and there's not an easy or good answer for it, except for that you experiment and you show the work and you have people in to look at it. Um, you can never make work for everybody, right? So that's in part, I think, what people mean when they say like, don't think about your audience. And that, there's a lot of truth in, in that respect. Um, you can't make work for everyone, but at the same time, we are accountable, right, as image makers and image producers um, to think about what we are sharing and the impacts it might have. And so I think, for me, the best kind of um, approach is to do my best to, um, to let myself go through the processes, right? Like, let yourself have the impulse. Oh, this is my first impulse. Okay, blah, blah, get it out. And then edit, right? And then go, hmm, okay, what if I consider it from this angle? Oh, I didn't think of that. Um, can I rework that in a way that might, and, and through that process, you, I think, can still come to something that has integrity to whatever your original interest is, but also might take into account ways it could affect other people. I, I hope that doesn't sound too generic. It's hard to address it, um, but I, I really appreciate your question about it because it's, it's a real one. And um, I think it's something that we think about, especially now, right? We can't ignore this question, for instance, of people posting pictures of police killing people online, right? Like, and um, this question of sharing that information or not sharing that information and seeing it or not seeing it. I personally don't watch them, but I'm in the streets 
at every protest and riot. Do you know what I mean? I'm there for abolition. I can't watch that violence. I don't, part of me is like, I don't need to see it, I know it. I know the violence of the state and I don't wanna, that'll re-traumatize me, so that's a choice I make kind of thing, you know what I mean? And that's different than with art, but I, I feel like it's a related question, so anyway. I hope that helps. <laughs> it's also one of the things that you are really getting at in Stand in the Stream, this idea of what do we do with all these images that are not contextualized and how do we offer them context and so that they can be understood and not just floating, violent or nonviolent, not just floating within this weird you know, sphere of information that is kind of thrown at you that you then have to deal with completely on your own which of course, yeah, is something that you can't guarantee, you don't never know how other people that would do that. But I think we talked about this previously with Stand, Stand in the Stream and I thought I was just reminded of that conversation about context and how, um, and how yeah, Stand in the Stream in itself uh, does these, has these moments where it's too much and then you kind of bring the viewer back in and you open up a different level or a different way of understanding what's going on, this kind of, cross-generational exchange or also activism uh, that then roots us again to then kind of be braced for all of these really quick thrown in um, images of, of protests but also of, of animals and, yeah. and death um, in general. So Yeah, yes, thank you. I'm glad that that work does that. Um, should we take one more and then be done? I don't know how we are for time or, what's that, we're good? What last, last one? Question. Okay, yeah, sorry. Was there, yeah, last question. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I was really struck by the, um, by the, I haven't seen the film yet, but by uh, Don't Go Backs, or No Go Back, sorry. Um, and the kind of, the what well, feels like a change in tone. Um, and, uh, I was wondering if it if it also f it's like a change in strategy somehow for you. Um, like another thing that really struck me in the talk was the like a reference in one of the other films to Tahrir Square and the the movements of the squares and these things are sort of failed revolutions. And I th I think yeah that that in a way it's like a bit of a slap in the face, kind of like going back and thinking about that moment and maybe some of the optimism that there was there and some of those strategies and um, yeah, like uh, reconsidering what political strategies we might have in, in the wake of, of those things. But um, I don't know if the, there's an artistic parallel for you also mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in changing what it feels like a big change in style for me for this one and, and, uh, and maybe a bit more timeless if I can say that like uh, I also look at this still behind you and it, it kind of could be now but it could be another time as well um, yeah this sorry this is a messy question no, but. that's okay I think I'm with you thank you um, and I think it's a it's a it's a it's a good question and I you know what's interesting is that um, I understand why you say failed revolutions and there, there, there were so many failings that are painful and losses in that, but I don't, in a broader picture of history, which I try to you know, bear and keep in my sights, I don't think of them as failings because they, they huge change was made. Like, um, and especially for instance, um, the uprisings of 2020, and the movement for black lives, um, even though the police killed more people this year than they ever have before in one year in the States, um, and they got more funding, not less, um, I don't see those uprisings of having failed. I see that there is a movement that um, was became global and that it's building, and now more people know the word abolition than did before. So. I think that maybe an artistic parallel is that, like for me with no go backs, um, I, it was like I, I took a break from language. I took a break from the scroll, um, in part out of exhaustion, but also maybe as a reset. You know, like we can't 
escape. We can't get away from um, rhetoric. We can't get away from taking a position. We can't get away from participating. But um, at the time, I was thinking, ah, oh, maybe we need a pause, though. We need a film in which no one is told there's nothing didactic about it and that the viewer has enough room to sort of the, sit and consider um, themselves in relation, whether it's to the land or to all of these issues and thoughts. So I think that I was um, artistically maybe kind of just needing a moment of respite and a kind of a resetting, knowing that there's still so much work to be done, if that makes sense. So it's like an energetic shift, but maybe still along the same trajectory. And what what you don't really see in the trailer so much is what happens. So these kids, they go alone on this journey, but in the very, well, just spoiler alert, whatever, but in the very end, um, you see all of these other kids flowing out of the city. And you realize as the credits are rolling, they're flowing out of the city and you realize, oh, they're gonna have community. They're gonna have to deal with each other. Here we are, start, you know? So it almost, it's like, oh, here we go. Okay, they're, go they're not gonna be alone, isolated by themselves in the wilderness. They're gonna have to survive with each other. And thus, discourse will have to start all over again, if that makes sense. Cool, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, thank you for being here and your <laughs> great question.